we call to the cloud. Okay, so I'm um, I'm starting again with the two last. Uh, I hear some kids. Playing. So I don't know where it comes from. Maybe. Uh, Who has babies? <laughs> not me, mine, are not, mine are, not, are not here. Um, so next uh, is really from 1999 onwards. Wait a second, I'm gonna do something. Probably Leonardo. Does that work? It seems to work. Um, so here I, I um, so at the beginning of the millennium, uh, 1999, 2000, uh, there came really source to sync. So and it was already S two S. So this was a program of the NSF. The NSF is the National Science Foundation. Is the American Science Foundation. We have the same in Switzerland. It's also called, uh, except it's called SNSF, Swiss National Science Foundation. And um, so the American had a big program called Margins, um, in which there were several sub program. One was uh, about uh, rifting, one was about the subduction factory, and one was source to sink. And so it was, it really, uh, I, can, I can give you, or you can find, I, I can give you that, uh, I have the PDF of that, but um, the, the, the PDF of the science plan uh, of the source to sync initiative is really a, a great document because it really uh, explains so much of what source to sync is and will become uh, afterwards. And so, as you can see, these are a few, um, a few figures of the source to sync scientific plan. You know, a scientific plan, maybe you don't know that, but the way we work is sometimes I, for instance, as a researcher, I submit a project to the Swiss National Science Foundation. So it's a project for one or two students. But sometimes uh, there is bigger projects. Uh, big projects in which, in which there is many, many uh, scientists around a central topic, a central field, uh, and, 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 uh, and then within that there is smaller sub-projects, uh, but it's a big thing. And so in this case, you have a scientific plan. I actually advise you to look at the um, uh, International Ocean Drilling Program, if you're interested, IODP. Uh, they have a new science plan for until 2050, I think. So for the next 20 years. And this is a big boat cruising around the earth and drilling the earth. And so they look for master students, uh, PhD students to go on, on the boat. It's very hard because you stay one month or two months on the boat. You work eight hours on the core, you describe the core, and then you sleep eight hours, etc. So you, you do like uh, shifts uh, and you work 24 hours, seven days uh, during one or two months. So you're far away from everything during, during a long time. And this can be in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, or in the tropics. But this is very interesting uh, as a scientific experience. And there is a science plan just, uh, just out for, uh, for the IODP, for instance. And so in, you see these diagrams were uh, really setting the, the, the stage for source to sink. Um, you have a, a, whole, a margin here with source, uh, a trust here, the sediments, uh, the slope, the, the basin fan. You have uh, geotrophic currents, along shelf currents. You have a plume here. Uh, you have storms on the shelves. You have the system struct of the sequence stratigraphic approach, the, the, the previous diagram I showed you. So there is a lot of thing embedded in, in this diagram of, of principle. So margins are shaped by processes that extend from the source of sediment to, the, to their depositional zone. 
So it's an important idea that what you see on a margin, you go on West Africa, you are the beach. The shape of the margin is, no, is made not only by the ocean, but also by everything that happens upstream of the margin. Okay. Here, are, uh, here is a simple uh, drawing of, um, of the dispersal system. The dispersal system, the system, the dispersion of sediment. So it's the sedimentary system. And so you have, again, you have sources, you have transfer area, uh, you have sink uh, area. And so you have a, a whole range of different depositional environments and, and processes. And it's a very 3D three-dimensional uh, system. And here is the ipsometric configuration of the different uh, environmental units and boundaries of the source to sink concept. Um, so ipsometric means the area elevation distribution. So clearly it's, it's, like, it's like looking at topography. But so you have a little bit of the mountain, which is represent a small area of the source to sink system, but at a high elevation. Uh, the plains are a big area at a small elevation, and then you go on the sea, in the sea, the shelf, the slope, the rise, and the abyssal plain. So there are different proportions, and these are different segments of the source to sink system. And these segments are separated by boundaries. And this is very important. The coastline, for instance, is a very important boundary. Is the ocean continent transition. And this boundary has a clear signature in the sediments. So we can find it for ancient sediment. We can know where it was 20 million years ago in a, in a specific basin. And the movement of these boundaries tell us something about everything happening in the system, not just things happening here, OK? So the variations of the, the, the movement, the motions of these boundaries, or here the gravel sand transition, they tell us something about all the processes happening in the whole system. Okay. So this was a big, uh, this was a big thing uh, uh, at the beginning of the 2000s. And in this science plan, and as the last, let's say the last historical step um, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, presentation, um, there is the idea of signal propagation. So this is already in the science plan. This is a drawing I took from the science plan. And the idea is that in the source to sink system, from the mountains into the plains, on the shelf, the slope, and the abyssal plain, what happens to different signals? For instance, uh, here you have the relative sediment load. So this is time and this is magnitude. Let's say you have an increase because of earthquake or because of tectonic, you have an increase in sediment flux out of the mountains. What happens to it in the plains? And what happens to, to this initial signal as it goes down the system? Does it reach the abyssal plane in this way? Do we see an increase in the abyssal plane? Or do we not see an increase in the abyssal plane? What if it's constant in the mountains, but we see something like this in the abyssal plane? Why would that be? Okay, so there could be many different uh, possibilities for signal propagation into the system. And this is very important because sometimes we have a basin here on the shelf and we see something like this. How can we translate this into that? How can we from that know that this happened in the mountain? Or from that predict that this will happen in the downstream part of the system? So how signals propagate in the system is, uh, is a fundamental uh, issue. And uh, in a recent, or not so recent, but 2016 paper with my, my colleague uh, Brian Romans and Jay Kovolt, Andrea Fildani, and uh, John uh, Walsh, 
uh, we um, we kind of reviewed these uh, these uh, topics in in enough science reviews uh, paper called environmental signal propagation in sedimentary systems across time scales. Um, and here is the sedimentary system again. And another way of seeing what I just said is this, is that you have time and you have a forcing, a forcing when forçage can be uplift, precipitation, flood, storm, can be human. That results into, for instance, uh, an increase in erosion and then decreasing. This results in an increase in sediment supply, boom, out of the erosion zone. Okay, is this transmitted with high fidelity, like a hi-fi audio system, or is it dampened, is it attenuated and shifted with time? This can also happen that your signal reaches the basin much after and with a lower amplitude. So signal propagates and transforms as it propagates. And so understanding this is fundamental because we have a full record of everything that happened in the mountain. We have it here in the sedimentation zone. But we have this and we need to reconstruct this. Okay, so we need to know the transfer function from erosion to accumulation from source to sink. In addition, uh, and I, I will show that maybe uh, in the next slide, in addition, you have what we call, so all of this here is allogenic. Allo, like alloctone means means uh, étranger, mean external. So, and genic means generated by. So, this is allogenic signal. So the signal that we have here is generated by an increase in uplift or an increase in climate. But in addition, you have autogenic signals. Autogenic signals are signals that are generated um, within the system, from within the system or by the system itself. So, uh, for instance, you have a river switching and suddenly eroding a former bend, uh, a former meander bend, you will have an increase in sediment supply. Or for some reason, uh, you have uh, your river avulses. At some point, you will see a decrease in sediment supply. Uh, at another point, you will see an increase. So it's the internal dynamics, uh, internal behavior of the system that generates itself additional um, additional uh, signals. And here is one, uh, one other figure of this uh, in the same paper, uh, the Romans and, and colleague uh, 2016. And here you have three, three levels. Tectonics in red, climate in green, and internal dynamics in, uh, in black. And, and basically, it's a way, uh, and I will, um, I will comment this much more another time, but it's a way to try to understand how signals generated by tectonics can actually transform uh, and reach and become, from this become this into the deposition zone, or from this become nothing into the deposition zone, okay? Same thing for precipitation. They can become, they can be very cyclic like this, or precipitation, or or any other climate, could be temperature, become nothing in terms of sediment supply, or are transmitted with high fidelity, or are even amplified. Okay. And it's a bit like a radio system. Uh, you know, there is an emitter here at the RTS. And you have a, you have a speak you have headphones. You know between the emitter and your headphones, uh, there is a whole transmission chain that that make it such that you hear the voice correctly or not. Okay, 
high fidelity means that the voice of the person speaking there in the room is really similar or the one you hear in your in your ear is really similar to the one of the person and it and it arrives in your in your headphone at the same time as it's, as it's spoken it's direct transmission uh, sometimes you look at tv and there is a journalist on the field speaking in the microphone and we see the mouth moving and the sound comes later there's a bit of delay okay sometimes we also don't hear very well there is a bit of attenuation of the sound there can be also a transformation or there can be a destruction of the sound it can be completely shredded okay so all of this is signal propagation This is just a small video of autogenic I have uh, I found yesterday, and you have the the source. Uh, it's a group uh, of um, of researchers I, I like a lot: uh, Elizabeth uh, Hajek, uh, Kyle Straub, uh, and others working in Tulane, but also uh, working a lot in uh, Minnesota uh, in the lab of Chris Paula, and they do uh, physical experiments. A physical experiment or laboratory experiment are uh, experiments in which we use uh, water, sound, and we do mini rivers, mini deltas, and we look at how they behave. And um, you know, we have this also in, in Geneva, we, we developed that in Geneva. But here, yeah, I really like these kind of experiments because you see uh, uh, the source, the transfer, and the sink with the delta. And you see everything is constant here. So this, the supply of sound and the supply of water are constant with time. Yet, you see a very dynamic system because the, 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 the river uh, moves around and distributes sediment. You know, the, the flow is, is uh, localized into channels. So in order to, to uh, distribute the sound everywhere on the delta, the system is continuously moving and bifurcating and switching such that if you would look at, a, at a, you will make a core here where my hand is, you will see a lot of sediment uh, cycles. You will see a lot of mini cycles. And you could wonder, are these mini cycles due to climate, due to tectonics, earthquakes, or are they just autogenic, generated by the internal dynamics of the system? And so, this is fundamentally important for uh, our understanding of the Earth system evolution through time. Because if we cannot differentiate between what is internal kind of noise versus what is linked, associated with environmental conditions such as climate, tectonics, then we cannot tell the story of the Earth from the sediment. So understanding all of this is, is, uh, is very important. There is also an important industrial application is that all these autogenic signals are probably at a smaller scale and we do not expect them to take place uh, to take place uh, all at the same time on Earth. Okay, they are autogenic, they are associated with the internal dynamic of this system. So there is no reason that a sequence generated by autogenic signal here is the same on the other side of the globe. Okay, only things that are generated by common uh, factors will, will be generated everywhere. And so the, the lateral extension of, of those sedimentary packages linked to autogenic or allogenic signals are going to be very different in their uh, lithological characteristics, their stratigraphic pattern and arrangement and their lateral dimensions uh, uh, and, and time uh, and, and the span of time that they, that they, that they represent. So, so this is very, uh, very important. Okay. All right, we are switching uh, chapter here. So we've done the historic of the source to sink approach, very uh, basic historic uh, view of the source to sink approach. Um, now I, I have this little uh, chapter or paragraphs about the gains 
um, so the advantages and the limitations of the source to sink approach. Um, in fact, I don't have much of the limitations um, prepared uh, yet, but I will try to, to say a word about the, the, the limitations. And so these are more the gains. Um, and I divided them in two parts. Part number one is basically linked with uh, the industry or applied uh, geosciences, if you want. Part two is more linked to uh, fundamental uh, knowledge of the Earth uh, system, our ability to understand uh, the planet, the planet uh, to better uh, face global change or even maybe predict uh, the Earth uh, behavior uh, in face of uh, perturbations. So the first part applied is a strong improvement in the ability to predict reservoir uh, characteristics. So sedimentary rocks represent um, not a resource, but uh, often a host for resources. Of course, you know they represent a source, uh, uh, a host for hydrocarbons. But clearly, uh, clearly, this is not the only um, uh, resource uh, that that. Uh, that is contained by, by sedimentary rocks. Um, there is also water. There is heat. And they can also be a host for what we could potentially want, uh, what we, we may want to put into them, such as CO2, gas, uh, Etc. Or even uh, use them as a as a place where we will store nuclear waste, uh, just as a side remark. The Nagra in Switzerland, maybe you know the Nagra, it is the national agency for the for la gestion. Uh, I think it's of resource atomique. Uh, ou sur la gestion ou le recyclage des, des déchets atomiques. Bref, is the national uh, agency for that deals with atomic waste, and they look for a place where they can put this atomic waste, a place that will be safe on the very long term, because we speak about hundreds of thousand years. Okay. So we need to know not only the characteristics, we cannot put them in, in, uh, in any reservoir. We have to choose a reservoir that is well protected also by clay around it so that it's safely enclosed and, and is not gonna leak. We have to know that the tectonic is not gonna make faults into it such that if there is a leak, it's not gonna go through to the surface. And we may also want to know that it's not gonna be eroded away by future glacial periods or future rivers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so yeah, the world is of hydrocarbon maybe is uh, still going on in the sense that we still need hydrocarbons, but there is a, a, a huge amount of uh, of um, other uh, practical uh, societal um interest into uh, into reservoirs uh, sedimentary reservoirs and so the source to sink approach really gives uh, um, uh, a very strong um, mean to leverage uh, uh, the um, uh, sedimentary geology to reduce uh, risk when you explore uh, um, a domain and, and you want to know more about the subsurface. So 
sequence stratigraphy will give you the lithologies time, but with source to sink, you will complete this with volumes and nature of the deposits. Okay. Um, so here is how to see that again. Uh, you know, in this diagram, um, I just wanted to show that sequence stratigraphy explain you why you have this sedimentary architecture by linking sedimentary architecture with the sea level curve. Okay. Now we are at high sea level. When the red dot and sea level was here, we were here. When the red dot was here, we were in the high stand. And when it was here, we were here in the, in the low stand, in these deposits. Now, sediment input is considered constant. And so sequence stratigraphy by itself lacks predictive power on the volume coming in and on the nature of what's coming in. You know, knowing all these and sea level doesn't tell you whether this is what coming here is what comes here is feldspats or quartz or clays. It doesn't tell you anything about the black arrow here of sediment input. Okay. like to do to get back to this so so yeah I, I just wanted to show the, the the arrow here that is very um, it's a, it's a black box coming in into the system and it's constant so the basin record only looks at the basin but source to sink Sorry, I have an issue with my PowerPoint. Source to sink tells you to consider everything which is upstream of the basin. And by knowing this, you know what's coming in and how much is coming in. And this is fundamental for knowing the volumes and the nature of your uh, reservoirs. Again, the nature of your reservoir. Do you know why this is important? I think you, you have to realize that you mean, I mean, a reservoir. I would say, for instance, in the best case, you have a sandstone with pure sand and, and pores. That's good. Uh, let's say to store something into it, for instance, water could be absolutely nice water because it's not going to interact too much with the quartz because quartz is very inert. It's like glass, silica. But what if your reservoir is made of um, quartz and feldspars and I don't know, whatever, other minerals? then your water is going to be dissolving, interacting, weathering. Let's say you want to uh, inject CO2 uh, into your reservoir. Your, your CO2 will interact with your host rock. So you may generate new mineral phases that you don't want. Okay. You may even, I don't know, generate gas that you don't want and other pressures that can, that can break. You know, I don't think it's possible, but maybe you make, uh, you make a bad uh, chemical reaction and your, your thing explodes. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not knowledgeable about, about this at all, but I know that CO2, for instance, clearly interacts with, uh, with limestone. Uh, you know, when it's dissolved in water, it dissolves uh, limestone, it makes acids. Uh, it's going to for sure interact with also basic uh, rocks. So mafic rocks, massive clast. So, you know, predicting the lithologies coming in is very important. Just to give a, more of mental knowledge about this, at the beginning of your mountain range evolution, 
maybe you erode first the sedimentary cover, okay, the limestones. All these limestones, you know, in the Alps, uh, you know, all the Jurassic, Cretaceous limestones, when you have the collision, the first thing to, to be uplifted is this. So first you have a lot of carbonate clust. With erosion going on and tectonics going on, you progressively ex exhume deeper and deeper seated rocks, more and more granitic rocks. And so you, you change the composition of your, of your sediment flux with time. Your sediment flux evolves with time, okay? And the volume also evolve with time. At the beginning of the mountain belt evolution, you have uh, relatively slow uh, uplift rates increasing, but erosion is not yet, the drainage networks are not yet well developed. And so erosion cannot catch up with uplift and your mountain range is growing. But at some point erosion catches up with uplift and the two are in equilibrium. And so you deliver a lot of sediment to the basin. So you can kind of predict the volume of rock going, uh, coming into the, the basin. So when you combine this with sequence stratigraphy theory, you have a very powerful predictive method for predicting the volumes and nature of rocks in a sedimentary basin. Now, another aspect, uh, fundamental aspect of the source to sink approach is the fact that a system, a, a source to sink system can be seen a little bit like, uh, like a body, a human body. You know, uh, if you look at a baby human, often they have a big head, uh, but small hands, small arms, small legs, small feet. <coughs> and so different parts of the body grow with different rates. The head is big at the beginning and doesn't grow too much. So uh, it's fortunate that our head doesn't grow as fast as our feet, okay? Because we will have huge heads. Um, but, you, you know, we keep the same proportion. For instance, our hands, the, the length of the fingers and the size of the hand are linked. And so when we are small, we already have a small, we also have small fingers, small hands, so all of this is, is, uh, is growing progressively such that we kind of keep the same proportions. And there exist also in nature such proportions. So in a system like this, and this is a paper by Tor Somme and, and um, colleagues, William ha Helen Hansen, Ole Martinson, John Termond, um, they are from the formerly Stator Hydro uh, Research Center, but now Equinor Research Center in, in Norway. And that's also a, a, a paper that is really uh, good and it, it's, a, it's a, a huge work making a synthesis of uh, the, 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 the proportions, uh, the geometric proportions of the different segments of uh, source to sink systems. So it's based on looking and reviewing many, many source to sink systems uh, in the world. And if you look at the paper, you will see there are many, many of those diagrams. And here I just took the one of the last ones, I think, um, which is looking at the fan. This is the fan, the deep sea fan. So it's the, turbid the turbidites on the basin floor. And you know, the fan volume can be linked with the width depth relationship of submarine canyons. The fan width can be linked with fan length. The long-term deposition rate in the fan can be linked with the fan length. Um, the fan area can be linked with the slope length. So all of this is like uh, linking, you know, the length of our arm with the length of our hand. For sure, there are many variations. People have smaller, uh, hands, some people have bigger hands for the same arm length, but you see in general, you have some sort of relationship, a scaling relationship. So if you have, if you can characterize, you know, you have a seismic line and you can say we have a fan length of a hundred kilometer, 
then you can predict without another seismic line that you should be with a fan width of between 50 and 120 or 200. Okay, so you have a, a guide of the proportions of natural source dosing systems, and that's incredibly predictive uh, for uh, the industry and for us for calculating volumes, for instance. Okay, so, so yeah, in this perspective, uh, you know, studying modern sedimentary systems uh, is, is fundamentally important to, to, uh, to define those relationships and, and allometric scaling relationships uh, inside and between the different segments of, of ancient sedimentary systems. I don't know if I pronounced the word before, allometry, a L L O metry M E T R Y A -2 -L O M E T R Y allometry. Allometry is the study of the relative proportions and, and how they grow uh, within uh, within a system. Um, I'm almost finished and that's good. Uh, so here is another uh, thing that I wanted to say. Uh, that's from the group of Philip Allen uh, at Imperial College, with uh, especially collaborators uh, John Armitage, uh, Andy Carter, Rob Duller, Nick Michael, Luke Sinclair, which is in Edinburgh, Amy Whitchurch, Alexander Whitaker, still at Imperial, uh, and and with whom I, I I work. And that's the group of Phil Allen really made a huge um, effort into focusing on QS, the sediment flux. And so the, the project of Phil Allen was the QS uh, problem, the, the, the problem of the flux of sediment. And in particular, I studied that a lot in the Pyrenees. Um, maybe that's where we will be going in spring if we don't go to Sardinia and, and it's allowed in, in, uh, in, in Spain, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Um, but he showed uh, how, I mean, they really studied uh, how tectonic climate uh, combine into a mountain range in uh, producing sediment flux with certain grain sizes. That's something I didn't mention before, but not only the nature of the grain, but also their size is important. And how this grain size then fines down into the basin. You see the fining here? So this is a very nice symbolic view of grain size fining. So you go from large grains to smaller grains. Okay, and the rate at which you fine, at which you go from fine to, uh, from coarse to fine, tells you something about what is delivered from the source area, but also how these grains are trapped into the basin. So there is here a whole, I would say, theoretical framework and conceptual framework for understanding CDC clastic uh, deposits into tectonic basins uh, in the context of source to sink uh, uh, the functioning of source-to-sink systems.